Hi, this is Professor Angela Rasmussen from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Utah. Today I'm going to talk about amplifiers and their non-ideal effects. So the non-ideal characteristics that I'm going to go over is the DC offsets, input bias currents, speed limitations, and output saturation. So for DC offset, what actually is happening is that there is a an offset inside. So when I do apply zero volts to both of these inputs, I expect to have zero volts out. What I see is an actual shift. So instead of being at zero volts for my zero volts in, my output graph will actually be shifted. And so it will look something like this, where it's actually shifted by an amount. How to compensate for that is that on the chip itself, you're gonna have these offset null options. And so depending on which chip you have, these this offset can be used to um, trim basically so that when you do have zero volts on both inputs, you get zero volts out. So you usually put a potentiometer between those and then adjust them to, to the point where you see zero volts out. So this is the best way to compensate if that is a um, factor for your design is to pick an op amp that actually has these offset null um, internally made. Uh, one note is that these two graphs were taken from um, this link, so thank you. So I wanna look at um, the actual values of what those shifts will be. So a lot of times in data sheets, they're gonna give you a range of values for a specific parameter. So for example, the input offset voltage may be given a typical value and a max value, or you'll be given a min value and a typical value. So you wanna always pick the worst case values. So for input offset voltage, if I was to use amp 2 here, so this column, I'm going to have 4 and 5 millivolts offset. So I want to pick um, the worst case scenario, and in this case it would be the one with the most offset. So we would use 5. And how we're going to calculate this is that as seen here, this looks like it's on the positive input terminal. So it looks like an actual signal on that positive input terminal, terminal which is always going to look like a non-inverting gain. So no matter what configuration you actually are calculating this for, you're going to amplify this input offset voltage by the non-inverting gain factor. So in this case, a non-inverting gain would be 1 plus uh, 20k over 1k for a value of 21. And so my offset is actually gonna be the worst case scenario of five milli times 21. And my if my input is Vn of 0.1 and the ideal gain of this is a inverting amplifier, so this is gonna be a minus 20k over 1k for a gain of minus 20. My output is going to be 0.1 times 20. It'll be the opposite, so that's where the negative comes. And then I have this offset of 105 milli. So I get 105 milli minus 2 sine omega t.
So my max value is going to be two point one oh five, and then my min value is going to be this um, a minus one point eight nine five. So those would be my ranges that I'm going to see due to that voltage offset. So the next um, non-ideal effect is called the input bias current. So the input bias current has inputs internally that we also don't want. These are due to the draw from the bipolar transistors at the base, remember, that there is some current that's being drawn, although we don't always want it to be that way. So some of these um, op amps have that. So what you wanna do for the input bias current is that you can compensate, depending on what your configuration is, is that you want to have an equivalent resistance so that when you're looking at the voltages, that you have the same current that's being calculated for the same current times the resistance. So what you typically do is that you're gonna look at this node and the equivalent resistance with these were all grounded. This is R1 and R2 is to put a value for R3 equal to the equivalent on the other terminal, which is R1 in parallel with R2. So what we wanna do is modify this circuit um, to minimize the effect of the input bias current. And so what we wanna do is add a resistor here so that the whole equivalent resistance on this side is equal to the equivalence on that side. So we can see that that's gonna be 20K in parallel with 1K, but we already have this 100 ohm resistor here. So we're gonna put this value at 20K in parallel with 1K minus 100. And so that gives us a value of 852 ohms. So we're gonna put an 852 ohm resistor here, and the equivalent of that adds up to be 952 ohms, which is what is seen at this node. And so that's gonna minimize the input bias current. The other factors that we have is due to speed limitations, and there's going to be two that you have to consider. One is due to the finite bandwidth internally to this, and the other is due to your output um, based on your input, and that's called the slew rate. And so we need to calculate both of these. Whichever one, due to your situation, is gonna be the lowest, is gonna be the worst case scenario, and so that's what's gonna limit your frequency range. So what happens in every op amp is that it is created so that it has an internal roll off of a minus 20 dB per decade drop. I didn't draw that very well, but um, that will give you a single pull. And so this is called an internally compensated operational amplifier when it has this single pull output. And most are actually created this way because they create stability when you connect them in a negative feedback configuration. So this would be the transfer function for this. Um, and what happens is that as you get to this point down here, so this is going to be where it's going to curve. So I can call this whatever W I want. So this would be my break frequency. And this point here when there, it's at unity is called the unity 
And so that's when I have zero dB or one volt per volt. So unity frequency, you'll also see it as F of T or F of small t. And so what happens is that you have a, what you're going to find is that for any configuration you create, you're going to follow the same graph. And what you're going to find is that this frequency here is going to be based on your gain here. So if I have an increased gain, I notice that my roll off will always be the same and that this frequency will be less than the frequency for this omega. So if this is two and this is the gain of two. So as my gain goes down, my frequency goes up and vice versa, if my frequency goes down, my gain goes up. So there's a, a correlation between these two called the gain bandwidth product. And what that is, is that it's the multiplication of the gain times your bandwidth. So remember this W2 and W1 are what gives you your bandwidth for this circuit. And so that gain bandwidth product is equal to this unity frequency. So you're gonna see it as the gain bandwidth product or unity frequency. And so for accuracy, no matter what configuration you're gonna put it in, it's always gonna be in the inverting configuration. Sorry, non-inverting configuration. So for example, this is an inverting amplifier which has a gain of the RF over RN. What we're gonna use for the gain here is going to actually be one plus the RF over RN. So as an example, in this case, we wanna use amp one. We wanna find the bandwidth for the circuit based on the unity gain bandwidth limitations. So the unity gain values are given here. So in this case, it's 100. And that's in megahertz. So we're gonna use this gain bandwidth product and we want to find this bandwidth, which will be our frequency. So F of C for that critical frequency is equal to 100 meg over, in this case it will be, remember the ideal gain was 20. And so the non-inverting gain is gonna be 21 so we're gonna use that 21 for more accuracy and that gives us 4.76 megahertz is our bandwidth. So you can see as you increase the gain, this F of C will decrease. The other limitation is due to slew rate. And what slew rate is, is basically that the output isn't able to respond fast enough to your input. So it starts to look like this, where this would be your ideal. And I do want to note that this figure was taken from this reference here. And what happens instead is that it can't actually increase fast enough at the output, and so you get a distortion. So we'll follow it a little bit, but then it starts to go too fast, so then it goes down, and then it will go back up, and then it doesn't quite match 
I think I drew it wrong here. It doesn't quite match the graph and then it will be able to start charging again. And so this is a slew rate. And so if you go too fast, you start to get this distortion. So we need to keep it under the maximum frequency. So the derivation of this is done in the book. Um, this is another view of what the slew rate looks like when you have, um, you're supposed to have an ideal output of a square wave out, which is the dotted lines there. You can see here that it doesn't quite match that. So it goes up and then it will match it for a little bit and then it's, it's changed too fast and so it takes it a while to actually follow the graph again. And so we use this equation, this F max is equal to the slew rate over two times pi times your output maximum. So that depends on what your input is. So we're gonna go back to this example again. We're gonna use this op amp one and here again, we see two values for the slew rate. So the lower frequency is gonna be the worst case. So in this one, the worst case is the lower value. So we're gonna use the five, which will give us the lower value, and we need to make sure we know what units it's in. So this F max, we need to put this in seconds for the slew rate. So the slew rate will be five divided by one times 10 to the minus six over two pi. And now we need to figure out what the maximum output will be. So based on this input of Vn of 0.1, the gain again was 20, our output is gonna be a minus <coughs> Um, minus 20 times 0.1 sine omega t and so the maximum is going to be a 20 times 0.1 so that's going to be our output maximum and this gives us 397 887 hertz and we can compare back to what we found for the frequency, which was 4.76 megahertz for the unity gain bandwidth. And so this is definitely going to be our more limiting range. So we would only be able to say that this circuit under these conditions can operate up to 397 or 98 kilohertz. The other characteristic is called output saturation. So you can see here that ideally it should go up to 15 volts, but it actually is clipping. So this is another type of distortion is this clipping. And so what happens is on a data sheet or on the first page of a data sheet, it will give you an output voltage swing or it will give you a range of you know, whatever voltage you use for your power slide supplies, usually about two volts less is what it usually is. Um, and so on this data sheet, you know, you can come down here and you see this output voltage swing and you see the ranges for a VCC of 15 volts actually will be a range between 10 and 12 or 13 and 14 depending on if you're looking at the typical or the minimum. So worst case scenario, again, you would go with this first one, which would be between 10 and 12 volts. So this one drops almost five volts from what your supply voltage is. So that's not so great, but you do need to be aware of this as a designer because you, you will never get out exactly all of the power that you put into it. And so this is a something that you need to consider as a designer. I wanted to just show you some of these data sheets again like here is your input offset voltage and again you have a typical value and a max value. Looking at the worst case you would then pick this six millivolts as your worst case scenario for this. So 
anyway, these have ranges and I just kind of wanted to point those out on the data sheet. I wanted to show you some of the other nonlinearities. I mentioned clipping, so here you see some clipping um, distortion and there's a few different other types of distortion. So here you can see that, you know, it's not quite as sharp at the edges, so you're gonna get these rounded or more triangular peaks. And so this is because you're getting too close to either your power supply or you're moving from saturation a little bit into the triode region for this MOSFET. If it was a BJT, it would be moving from the active to the saturation modes. So you're too close to that and you're going to see this kind of a result on the oscilloscope. So again, there's some more distortion that you can kind of see. And so to do, remove some of that, you wanna shift that bias point so that you're not so close to either the power supplies or to that voltage at the gate or the base for a BGT or VGS for, or for the MOSFET, you don't want to have VDS to be too close to VGS minus VT. So when those get to be too close, when they're equal is when you're getting to where you're right on that border and we'll see a lot more of this distortion. All right, thank you for watching this video.